what is nearsightedness? What's myopia? Why do I even care? It's not something that requires surgery. It might not seem as if it's that important. Isn't all you need a pair of glasses to correct a child's nearsightedness? Well, here's the thing. Nearsightedness actually has to do with how long the eyeball is. So when someone is nearsighted, that means they can't see things far away, but things up close are relatively clear. Unless, of course, the vision is really high in terms of the myopia. Then even the up-close things can be blurry as well. But it's not just about whether or not you need a pair of glasses. That doesn't really interest me as much as you might think. What I'm really interested in is preventing any of the vision-threatening eye consequences that happen when a child or an adult becomes nearsighted. So when you have an eyeball that's nearsighted, that typically means the eye is longer than a normal eye. And we can measure that with something called the axial length. Think about it like a balloon and you're inflating the balloon with air and then you're putting in a little extra air. It stretches that material of the balloon a little more thin. That's basically what's going on with your eyeball when you're nearsighted. Your eye is stretched a little bit more thin. The retina, the inner lining of the eye, that's basically the camera film of the eye, is getting stretched a little more thin. And with that comes possible vision-threatening complications. So you've got retinal detachments. That's when there can be a break in the retina that causes fluid to escape underneath. Again, caused by that thinning of that balloon, thinning of the retina. This can also cause an increased risk of cataracts, of glaucoma, and something called myopic maculopathy. These are all vision-threatening eye consequences, and that's not something a lot of parents think about when they're giving their child their first pair of glasses. There's concern usually about, oh, my child can't see, I didn't know that they couldn't see, but usually parents aren't thinking, what does this mean down the road? And these are the things I'm hoping to prevent with really addressing the causes for nearsightedness and now employing treatments that can slow that progression of nearsightedness in kids. Why do we have this epidemic of myopia? Before, we didn't seem to see that many kids with nearsightedness, and it's truly increased in just a generation. It's predicted by the year 2050, half of the global population is going to be nearsighted. So what's changed? Well, I bet you know what's changed. It's the way that we live our lives, these modifiable lifestyle risk factors. Kids are spending less time outdoors and more time indoors and more time doing up close work, even on screens. So there you go, it's the screens. Not only the screens, but screens, reading, writing, even coloring, all of those things combined that's what constitutes near work. And when the eye is constantly focusing up close, we found an association with nearsightedness, needing glasses to see far away. We found now that even kids that were diagnosed with nearsightedness 20 years ago, the average age of onset was 11. So an 11 year old was getting a first pair of glasses at that time. Now, 20 years later, the average age of nearsightedness is Eight. That means kids are getting their first pair of glasses at a younger age. And this is really due to these lifestyle factors. The genetics have stayed the same. The family history has stayed the same. But what has changed is the amount of tutoring kids do, the amount of time that kids are spending on their phones or tablets or laptops, the amount of time that kids are just spending indoors compared to being outdoors. Now, screens affect kids in a lot of different ways, not just with nearsightedness. And we'll be tackling a lot of these issues in upcoming episodes, but screens can cause dry eyes, they can cause blurred vision from that dryness, and it can even mess with the circadian rhythm. So kids that are having more difficulty sleeping at night, or they've got more morning grogginess, all of this has been very well studied. But screens and nearsightedness is something that's relatively new and a new research studies showed every hour that children are on screens actually increases their risk of nearsightedness. There's a safe potential zone of about one hour. One hour of screen time a day, kids only increase their risk of nearsightedness by 5%, so not too bad. But once you get to four hours a day, that increases their risk by 91%. And every hour on top of that increases it by another 21%. 
So we're finding that screens really are linked to worsening this nearsightedness epidemic that we're seeing across the world, not just in our country. So what can we do about it? Well, of course, you can look at screens and we can start to try to impose some screen time limits, but there are other things that we can do. Now the genetics, as I said, they've stayed the same. There are a lot of risk factors for nearsightedness that comes from families. My own husband is nearsighted and he carries with him a lot of risks. Being East Asian is a risk factor. Getting your glasses, if a parent caught their glasses at a younger age, that's another risk factor. There's a lot of parental guilt associated with having kids and feeling like they inherited your eyes and that they inherited your bad eyes and that they're just as nearsighted as you are. But there are things that we can actually do. And it's not necessarily 100%. If a child has zero parents that are nearsighted, they still have a one in four chance of being nearsighted themselves. If they have a one parent that's nearsighted, it increases to a one in three chance of being nearsighted. And if both parents are nearsighted, there's a one in two chance that the kids will be nearsighted themselves. It's not 100%. That means there are things that we can do to decrease that chance of becoming nearsighted. And that's what I think is so important for parents to know because a lot of them are free and a lot of them don't require prescription or any kind of medication or contact lens for you to try. The first one, outdoor time. You've heard me harp on this before, but being outdoors has been shown in so many studies across the world in different ethnicities from the Inuit population in Alaska to Australia to Israel and Denmark, two hours a day of outdoor time has been shown to slow the worsening of nearsightedness in kids. This has also been extensively studied in Asia where they have a really large percentage of their population that's become nearsighted. 80% of high school seniors in Singapore are nearsighted. So it's a big problem there and they really are taking it incredibly seriously. So in China, what they've started doing is closing the doors to the school during lunchtime and recess because a lot of the kids were going back inside and they were studying during their lunch and recess time. They saw the data, they saw how important getting outdoors was, and they've become something that's mandated now even at the public health level. So super simple and free. Now, of course, I live in Hawaii, so I can make this happen year round. And for people that have some colder climates that they need to balance that out, even if it's cloudy, even if it's overcast, that outdoor time is beneficial at slowing that worsening of the nearsightedness. And what do I mean by that? Every year, if you wear glasses, you probably remember going to the eye doctor every single year, that glasses prescription got worse, right? Well, that's that progression of nearsightedness. And usually parents would ask me, oh, what vitamins can I, can I give my child? What can they do eye exercise wise or diet wise? There's really nothing like that that can slow that progression. But outdoor time absolutely can. For more tips on eye health, parenting, and staying focused in a busy world, follow me on Instagram at Dr. Rupa Wong or head to drrupawong.com. Until next time, Keep your vision clear, your priorities focused, and your family thriving.